Good evening. So we're looking at the topic of nurturing emotional connection within the context of marriage. And let's begin with, with what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, this concept of one flesh is not just referring to the, the physical state of, of, of Adam and Eve, but it's referring to a, a broader concept. Now, the concept of one flesh involves emotional, physical, intellectual, and spiritual intimacy. In Proverbs 18 and verse 22, the wise man says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. So God created the marriage relationship to be, to be good, to be something that, that benefits um, the couple. Uh, and it does so in, in, in many, many ways. Now I'm going to be sharing with you largely from the work of, of John Gottman. John Gottman is a, is a researcher. And um, he has done extensive work over the years. He has conducted the most extensive and innovative research into why marriages succeed or fail over the last 40 years. Uh, prior to the work that, that he did, and much of it with his, his partner, Bob Levinson, and also his wife, um, a lot of the work was, a lot of the research was based on questionnaires and it was based on anecdotal evidence, but he took uh, the whole area of relationships uh, to, to another level. He took it into the science lab. He observed couples just doing ordinary things, filmed them for hours and hours and hours, hooked them up to machines there, checked their, their heart rates, did all kinds of experiments. And, and, and what it's produced is a wealth of knowledge about uh, what makes relationship work. And uh, I'll be sharing with you from that research. Now, Gottman came up with the concept of the sound marital house, which, which is essentially uh, foundations for, for healthy marriage. And we're going to be looking at um, probably three of those concepts about building love maps, uh, sharing fondness and admiration, and, and the idea of, of turning towards instead of turning away, or, or, or in another term, accepting influence from one another. Uh, the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, two are better than one, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So we know that the foundation of a good marriage um, is, is God's presence in it. And what Solomon expresses here, the idea of two being better than one, um, but a threefold cord is not quickly broken, uh, we can draw from that the idea as an illustration, that uh, a marriage is not just a union of two people. It is a union of uh, the man, the woman, and God who brings them together, but also keeps them together. In rope making, um, it is, is a well-known fact that a three-fold cord is the strongest type of rope that you can have. Um, three is stronger than two. If you add a, a fourth, it actually weakens. So the idea is that this three threefold cord or the threefold union is the strongest that you can have. God is the one who binds the marriage together. Again, uh, the psalmist says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So marriage needs a strong spiritual foundation with God at the head of the house. But when we talk about spirituality, a, a, a good spiritual marriage. Again, going back to what I said in terms of the one flesh, we're not just talking about, you know, how we experience God. We're talking about a relationship that, that takes on board every aspect of our humanity, the emotional side and the psychological side, the social side, the physical side, the intellectual side. Um, so it embraces is all of all of those ideas. 
So one of the, the primary foundations for a healthy marriage is the quality of our emotional connection. And this is what we're going to be exploring uh, in, in our time together. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable for him. So the Bible tells us from the outset that we are created for connection. Uh, we are created to uh, exist within the context of intimate relationships. And that's not just speaking about marriage. Uh, intimate relationships in general. Uh, we need this in order to thrive. In fact, if we don't have uh, good, strong, intimate relationships, we suffer detriment in terms of our intellect, in terms of our uh, emotional well-being, in terms of our psychology. So, uh, in, in studies in neuroscience has demonstrated this, that we need relationships in order to thrive. Uh, we all know what it is like to, to feel alone in a crowd. And the feeling alone in a crowd, you, you can be surrounded by thousands and thousands of people, and yet you feel alone. So that tells us that, that this feeling of aloneness is not about proximity or geography. It's not about how close you are physically to other people. It's about heart connection. And when we lack that heart connection, that's what gives rise to, to aloneness and, and loneliness. Uh, Robin Williams, who, who sadly uh, took his own life, a uh, famous comedian, said this, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It is not. Uh, the worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. Um, I think actually that was said by a character that, that he played in, in, in one of his movies. But the idea there that you can be in a relationship with somebody who makes you feel um, worse than if you were by yourself. And this is a sad reality about um, some marriages that exist in society today. Um, John Gottman talks about the concept of marital drift. And it is a gradual shift from a positive uh, interaction to a negative focus. So initially, when couples get married, everything is hunky-dory. You know, we, we tend to um, look beyond those, uh, the, those idiosyncrasies that our spouse may have. But the more time we spend together, uh, the more the focus begins to shift on things that we don't really like about the marriage. And if we are not careful, uh, that marital drift can end up into um, a, a, a rift within the marriage relationship. In Mark chapter 4, uh, the Bible talks about the, the, the parable of the sower. And of the, the seed that falls on stony ground, uh, the, the illustration is that they that hear the word immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. And I put that, that quote there to, to just illustrate what can happen within the context of a marriage. So couples can begin well. You know, they, they, they have this, this strong, emotional, intense feeling toward one another. And as a result, they decide to unite their lives together. But as life um, goes on. As problems come in, as they as they they see sides of their their spouse that maybe they don't like so much, um, the initial euphoria of of coming together dies down, and, and and there is no solid root within the relationship to keep them grounded um, in in that marriage, and and sadly we see a lot of uh, marriages in our society today um, falling apart. So marital drift is 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 a is a real concern. Uh, marital drift can give rise to what John Gottman calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So if within the context of, of a marriage, 
couples are not tending to to each other they're not building their emotional connection they're not nurturing their intimacy it can open the door to these four horsemen which Gottman identifies as criticism uh, contempt defensiveness and stonewalling and just to break those down a little criticism refers to focusing on the person rather than the issue. So conflicts are always going to arise within a, a marriage. Um, and it's important to remain focused on the issue at hand. And it's very easy to turn issues into uh, personal slights. Um, for example, you can make a legitimate criticism about something and then all you have to do to turn that into a personal criticism is to tag on the end of it a comment like, um, what is wrong with you? And that changes the focus away from the issue and onto the person. Uh, then there is contempt. And Gottman describes contempt as the sulfuric acid of relationships. So contempt is, is when you... you you kind of look down your nose at the other person as if they are, are less than you. And, and if that kind of attitude is, is allowed to, to pervade within the relationship, it can destroy uh, that relationship like sulfuric acid. Then there is defensiveness. So defensiveness is a counter complaining. So if a, a legitimate complaint is raised within uh, the marriage, one spouse might say, okay, well, well, I asked you to do such and such and you didn't, uh, you didn't, you didn't do it. Well, what was going on? And then another person might respond, well, the other day I asked you to do such and such and, and you didn't. It's just like playing tennis going in back and forth. Um, and it's, 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 these are simply ways of evading personal responsibility within within a relationship and then there is stonewalling and stonewalling is complete emotional shutdown you know as the as the word suggests it is as if you are speaking to a brick wall you're getting nothing back and that can be one of the most infuriating ways of of um of operating within a relationship uh, the statistics, according to the research, is that uh, about 75% of stonewallers are, are men. And one of the reasons that, that men stonewall, um, it is said, is, is because of uh, emotional overwhelm. So because women tend to be better at, at marshalling their emotions and, and raising uh, issues to do with uh, the relational side of, of a marriage, uh, men can get overwhelmed and, and just want to, to disappear, take off, shut down uh, as a means to, to protect themselves. But these horsemen, um, you know, we can exhibit aspects of these, these horsemen within our relationship from time to time, and that's normal in any marriage. The problem is when those horsemen are rampaging through the relationship, when they become uh, the normal way of operating within a marriage. Now, one of the ways that, that, that we can um, overcome the, the, the four horsemen is to develop a deep, intimate knowledge of our spouse. And back in the, in, the, in the 70s, I believe, my memory serves me right. There was this program on, on TV called Mr. and Mrs. And, and in that program, the, the whole idea was to find out if couples really knew each other. So um, two couples would come out, um, they would have a brief chat, and then one would be sent into a booth and they would be given blindfolds and, and, and ear, earphones. And the, the other spouse would be asked three questions about their spouse. And then the other spouse would eventually return and see whether or not the responses they gave matched up. It's to find out, you know, do you really know your spouse? Well, this is a question which married couples today uh, should ask themselves. You know, do I really know my spouse? Well, one of the ways that, that uh, Gottman suggests that couples 
develop this, this deep knowledge is through the building of what he calls love maps. Now, love maps refer to the part of the brain where married couples store all the personal, personally important information about their partner's life. Uh, love maps, excuse me, love maps are work on the principle that emotionally intelligent couples know the little things about their spouse's life which create a strong foundation for friendship and intimacy. Uh, the psalmist, too, if we put that within the context of, of, of a spiritual relationship, uh, there is David praying to the Lord, saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, now, when David prayed that prayer, he was not asking God to know something that God didn't already know. God, you know, he is, he is uh, omnipotent. He is omniscient. He, omniscient. He knows everything. But what David was doing there was to open himself up to the scrutiny of God. He was making himself vulnerable. He was inviting God in to, to see who he really is and to reveal to him, um, to himself, who he, he actually was, to remove anything that was unlike God. And, and that kind of sets a pattern for, for how we relate within the context of, of our marriages. The more we get to know each other, the safer we feel within the relationship, the more able we are to open our hearts to, to have the challenging, difficult conversations. Um, but that's all, all founded on this, this deep knowledge that we have of one another. Uh, now, just referred to emotionally intelligent couples, and it's important to appreciate what emotional intelligence entails. And it is essentially the ability to be able to identify and analyze and regulate our emotions. So, and this is drawn from the work of Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence in the 90s within the context of the business world. But then uh, it, it's, it's expanded into all kinds of different fields um, and essentially teaches that if we want to progress in life, we really need to know how to build healthy relationships. So emotional intelligence involves the ability to be able to recognize and identify our emotions and then the ability to regulate those emotions, to be able to manage the feelings um, that arise within us. It then looks at the, how we relate to other people. So emotionally intelligent people are sensitive to their spouse's emotions. And once we are sensitive to our spouse's emotions, we can then uh, make adjustments in how we communicate that takes into account the impact that we have uh, on them emotionally. So um, building love maps asks some basic questions. You know, who are you on the inside? Well, what, what are your hopes and dreams, your basic beliefs and values? What is important to you? What are your current levels of stresses and worries? What are your deepest fears? Um, what are the areas in, in, in which you are growing? And it's important for us to, to be continually updating the love map because the person we, we were when we got married is not necessarily the same person that we are today. We have gone through different experiences. We've learned more. We've grown more. We've, we've had uh, trials and tribulations. And, and all of these things contribute to, to creating the person who we are today. So it is not enough to simply know who, who it was that I married back in whenever. Uh, we need to be continually updating the love map uh, so that, that we have an accurate picture of who our spouse is today. Um, now, the depth of emotional connection is dependent on the degree to which couples know each other. Um, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So the, the word new in this context is talking about 
the sexual relation that Adam and Eve had that gave um, life uh, to to Cain. Um, but the word it indicates a, a a level of intimacy. The Hebrew word is yada yada. Um, and it indicates deep intimacy. In the New Testament, the, the, the word is ginosko. Uh, and it's significant that the word ginosko, indicating this deep level of knowledge, is, is used in, in John 17 and verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the, 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 there is a, a connection between the, the physical union between a husband and a wife and the intimate knowledge that God has with his children. Um, they are both indicative of a, of a deeper, very deep level of, of connection. And then there's this interesting passage in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1 to 3. Now, Paul says this, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. Now that's an interesting phrase. Um, and we can sometimes kind of gloss over what, what is being communicated here um, and assume that what, what it simply means that God knows who we are. Well, we know that. God knows everybody, but that's not what this passage is referring to, because Paul specifically points to the fact that it is those who love God who are known by God. To, to be known by God is to receive his affirmation. It is to feel understood, forgiven, encouraged, and accepted. And to be known by God is referring to an experience we have as a result of our relationship um, with him. So to be known is to be loved. And this is a, a desire that God has put into the heart of every human being that is, 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 is born on the planet. Now, um, some people seek a relationship with God in order to fulfill that, that innate desire. Other people may look for that in, in, in ways that are contrary to, to biblical principle, but we all have that, that desire to, to be known. So to be known within the context of marriage is to trust your spouse with yourself. Uh, you grant them the option to love you or to reject you. And, and in, in any love relationship, there is an element of risk. Love requires risk. It is a calculated risk. But you cannot have deep intimacy with somebody without risking uh, your heart, without making yourself vulnerable with the possibility that you could be hurt or that you, you could be rejected. Um, but as I said, it is a calculated risk. When we give our hearts to somebody, and we should be very circumspect about who we give our hearts to, um, that's a result of a, of, a, of, a, of a relationship that develops over time, creating the, the safe place for one another so that we feel able to, to share what is on our hearts. So, so love relationships are not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> you know, this, is, uh, this can be challenging. It can be very challenging. Um, uh, a challenging thing to do, to develop a deep intimacy with somebody. Um, one of the ways, and it's a fairly simple way, that, that we can nurture this idea of building love maps and keeping up to date with what's going on in our spouse, spouse's life is, is to, it's a, it's a simple exercise, high point, low point. So at a given point in the day, we might not have the time to sit down and have a deep, intimate conversation. If we can, all the better. If we can put aside that, that time uh, to do that, great. Um, but if you don't have a lot of time, just ask each other, you know, what's, your, what's the high point of, what has been the high point of your day? Um, what's been the low point of your day? And that can be a, a, an excellent way of just touching base, finding out what's going on with each other. And then you could use that as a, as a basis for, for praying with one another, uh, supporting uh, one another. 
Um, so that's building love maps. Len Gottman talks about nurturing, fondness, and admiration. So couples in happy marriages tend to like each other uh, most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. And, and this is not rocket science. <laughs> you know, um, marriages are based on deep friendships. You know, um, there was a, a research survey done uh, which discovered that, that when it came to the reasons why married couples um, state that they are married, I think it was the percentages were in the high 70s of those who indicated that it was the quality of their friendship that really made uh, them feel happy in their relationships. So, so nurturing fondness and admiration is an antidote to the four horsemen uh, rampaging through a relationship. And one of the things that we can do to, to, to achieve this, this nurturing of fondness and admiration is to create a culture of appreciation as opposed to a culture of criticism. Um, I mentioned before that this the marital drift can lead us to a tendency to um, to identify the things that we don't like and then to criticize those things. But a culture of appreciation um, helps us to to refocus. You know, um, the poster says, "Keep calm and be excellent to each other." You know. Um, it's a good way of saying, you know, we, we need to treat each other uh, with, with, with the best motives at, at, at all times. Uh, in the spiritual context, Psalm 34, verse 1, the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Now, that is an intentional statement. And coming from David, it is, is particularly significant because David, taught, he, he went through all kinds of, of problems, you know, uh, difficulties, difficulties in relationships and, and being hunted to, to, uh, to be killed and um, challenges through, through, through military battles, all kinds of things that, that David went through. And yet he concluded that in spite of all of those things that, that went on in, in his life, that he would bless the Lord, give God praise at all times. Um, and this is the kind of intentionality that we can exercise within our marriages. Yes, we're going to have problems, we're going to have challenges, but we should have a, a mindset of looking for that which is praiseworthy within the relationship uh, rather than focusing on on uh, what is to be criticized. Um, and when I was doing counseling training, one of the exercises that that uh, my my professor recommended for couples was that you know, send them away with some homework. And their homework is to intentionally look for things in their spouse for which they can can praise them. Um, and pick a particular day when they're going to do that. But the challenge was, uh, don't tell the spouse which day it is. And at the end of the week, uh, let them guess which day they, they had chosen to, um, to, to focus on things to, to praise. Uh, and the idea of not telling them was that, you know, that, that kind of uh, gave an incentive to, to fix up for all the other days. <laughs> as well. So uh, we need to be intentional about looking for things to praise in our spouse. Why? Because focusing on and pointing out a spouse's weakness is a way of covering up our own. You know, I, I fully agree with the statement that, you know, the way we talk about other people says more about us than it does about them. You know, Matthew 7 says, take the, 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 the log out of your own eye um, before you, you try and, and point out the, the, 
or take the speck out of your own eye before you try and take the log out of other people's eyes. Uh, do do your own personal work first, then you'll be in a better position to, to relate in healthy ways to other people. Uh, there is a concept in psychology that perception is projection, which means that we tend to find what we look for. And, and this is why we need to be very intentional. We, we need to check our motives, because if we get into that kind of marital drift, negative mindset, we can begin to look for things that, that, um, that confirm our negative mindset. And that can even result in rewriting history. That some of the great things that happened in your relationship in the past, you can look back and say, well, no, they did this because of da-da-da-da-da. So um, look for what is good. Give the benefit of the doubt. You know, recognize the qualities that, that actually exist um, in, in the spouse. So and this, this creating a, a positive culture of appreciation is not about flattery. Flattery is when we give people compliments for things that, that are not necessarily um, reality. But, but praise is actually identifying real qualities that exist in the other person. Um, and they may be their characteristics. You know, when we praise God, we're not just saying praise God, praise God, praise God. We're actually identifying attributes of God for which he is praiseworthy. His character, his love, his strength, his generosity, his mercy. Similarly with our spouse, we're looking for things in their character that, that we can, can point out. Um, we should avoid taking our spouses for granted. And again, this can be the, the result of the marital drift. You know, when we, we are first in a relationship, we pay all kinds of attentions. But once we've, we've won the prize, as it were, we can, can relax on some of those um, attentions that we paid in the beginning. Um, don't be like the man who, 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 who you know, who, who'd been married for years and his wife complained and said, you never tell me that you love me response was, I told you I loved you when we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Uh, nah. Yeah, we, we, the, the, the way we are wired, we need to hear these things over and over again. Um, if we think in terms of our relationship with God, how many times does God remind us about how much he loves us? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 3. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God knows our need for constant reassurance of his love. And, and absolutely, it's important to, uh, to demonstrate that through our actions. You know, actions speak louder than words. But that doesn't mean that the words themselves are not important because the words show that we are thinking about the other person, that they are forefront um, in, in our minds. So, um, yeah, say those three little words. In terms of nurturing fondness and admiration, even conflicted couples can reignite their marriages by rekindling fondness and admiration. This is about reorientating the trajectory um, of, of, a, of, a, of a marriage that is, is going down a negative route. Revelation 3, verse 4 and 17. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. So the principle is uh, remember, repent, and repeat. Uh, f remember what brought you together in the first place. And what brought you together will keep you uh, together. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. The principles that build relationships in the first place are the same uh, principles that, that help relationships to grow in the long term. Um, Ellen White says this in the book, The Adventist Home, that the heart of the wife should be the grave for her husband's faults. And the heart of the husband should be the grave for his wife's faults. 
In other words, we as, as, as married couples should learn how to bury the hatchet. And, and the, the, the burying of the hatchet is, you know, you bury it in the ground so that uh, you, you're, you're signaling an end to, to conflict. Um, now, th this doesn't mean that we should ignore uh, legitimate complaints about things that can be changed. But what, what, what this is communicating is that what has happened in the past is in the past. We should not be doing, uh, you know, uh, emotional archaeology bringing up the past or all of those those things that we see as faults in our spouse this is about changing our orientation to to focus on on what is is good within the spouse nurturing fondness and admiration is about honoring you know uh, paul says in hebrews 13:4 that marriage should be honored by all. And that word honor is, is key. Uh, in one of my favorite books, Love is a Decision by Gary Smalley and John Trent, they talk about the, the idea of, of honor being the foundation of all healthy relationships. Um, and, and Strong's Concordance describes honor, the word, the Greek word there is time, and, and it talks about value or, or money paid or valuables uh, by analogy, the esteem of the highest degree, uh, that which is precious or of great price. Now, just imagine what our relationships would be like, what married relationships would be if both the husband and the wife treated the other person as if they were of, 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 of highest value. You know, esteem of the highest degree, precious and of great price. If a husband and a wife treated each other like a king and a queen, uh, what would what would marriages look like today? Um, how much? And here's the Mona Lisa. Uh, apparently, the the most expensive um, painting in in the history of mankind. Um, the, the the valuation by the insurers, I, I, it's in the the, the billions, um, which, which which blows my mind because at the end of the day, it's a very ordinary painting of a, of a woman. It's paint on canvas. You know <laughs> what makes it so so valuable, um, and I guess we we it is the value that we invest in something that determines its value. You know, if you are selling a car and somebody wants to buy it for for ten thousand pounds, well, that's what it's worth to them. If they want to buy it for a hundred thousand uh, pounds, that's what it's worth. If that's what how they value it, so so what kind of value do we invest in our marriages and in our relationships? First Peter three and verse seven, uh, Peter says, "Husbands, likewise." Dwell with them, talking about their wives, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So Peter gives instructions that husbands should, should treat their wives with, with value, with, with honor. They should be treated as, as precious. Um... In marriages, spouses periodically make what Gottman calls bids for their partner's can, attention, affection, and or, or support. Um, and the picture it indicates, you know, the, the, the four words that, that can often strike fear into a man's heart. Or we need to talk. Um, but it shouldn't, you know. Um, Women tend to be, uh, wives tend to be the emotional regulators of, of relationships. And, uh, and this is the, the taking the initiative to raise concerns within a marriage um, is important to keep marriages healthy. And husbands should be grateful that, that uh, their wives are willing to do that. 
Um, so these bids for connection, we, we, we regularly make these bids in order to get our intimacy needs met. But because we often feel vulnerable within a relationship, uh, these bids are made in, in subtle ways. And once those bids are made, spouses either turn toward one another or they turn away. And, and again, this is something that, that Gottman observed in his hours and hours and hours and hours just filming couples doing ordinary, everyday things. Um, he noticed these little bids for connection. And it was how those bids were responded to that indicated whether or not couples came together or, or, or they, they remained uh, more emotionally distant. And it could be something as simple as, you know, a husband or a wife asking, you know, do we have any, any washing up liquid? And the husband can either say, um, no, no, I did. Or he could say, no, I, I'm not sure. Let me go and check for you. Um, and there's a difference between those two things. And one is just a, a, a you know, very brief response. Let me get on with my own life. The other is, okay, you said something. Let me take interest in, and, and see if I can, can help out with this. So the, the, these bids for connection, as I mentioned, can be, be very subtle. Um, and I mentioned a vulnerability. So the bids can be likened to dipping a toe in the water to see what, what the temperature is. Um, so they test the water. So imagine a wife says, you know, it's a bit chilly in here. And she says it not because um, she is particularly cold, um, but maybe she's desirous of a little physical affection. She wants a hug, but maybe doesn't feel too... Uh, just want to come come out with it. Um, now, how the husband responds uh, would give an indication of 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 where his his mind is. So he might respond, say, "Well, go and put a jumper on," <laughs> or he might go go a little closer and put his arm around and and, and give her a hug or, or offer to put the heat on or whatever it is. But, but the bids for connection can be very subtle and, and how they're responded to can give an indication as to whether or not intimacy is built or, or they, they, the couple stays emotionally distant. So um, we need to be have our antenna up to notice. So stop missing the moments. We, we can miss opportunities for emotional connection because we, we don't recognize what the bids for connection are actually indicating. Oftentimes, uh, people don't make a second bid. If the first response they get is one which kind of shuts a door or, or is, is cold or unresponsive, um, oftentimes they won't make the, the second bid. So we can miss, miss important opportunities. Um, we need to recognize that when it comes to building emotional connection, there is no intimacy without vulnerability. And vulnerability simply means that we, we open ourselves up to the possibility that we might be hurt. We, we share something um, of ourselves um, that we, we don't share with, with, with all and sundry. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10, um, Paul says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, those who are not emotionally intelligent can see emotions as a sign of, of weakness. But our emotions are not a sign of weakness. They are, they are a sign of our humanity um, and a willingness to make ourselves vulnerable is actually a strength. It takes courage um, to make ourselves vulnerable to uh, another human being. And if there is anywhere that, that we should be able to do that, it is within the, within the context of our marriages. So vulnerability involves truth and courage, which aren't comfortable, but they are never weakness. Couples often turn away from each other's emotional needs out of mindfulness, not out of malice. So... 
it might just be that you know we, we, our minds are, are somewhere else where we're, we're not tuned into what is going on with our spouse and as a result we we miss those uh, important opportunities uh, hebrews 2 1 we must pay the most careful attention therefore to, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away and if that's important within our spiritual lives it is also important within our married relationships. It is how we interact in the small moments that ends up defining our lives. You know, it's the little things. Um, who we want to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years is dependent upon the, the small habits that, that we, we create now that the later foundation for, for uh, um, healthy interaction in our relationships. Couples who turn uh, toward each other remain emotionally engaged. There is the concept of the emotional bank and, and the more we turn towards, the more we, re we respond to our spouse in, um, in, in, a, in a healthy way and in a loving way and in a compassionate way and in an affectionate way. We kind of store up an emotional bank account. We, we create an, an environment of, of love so that when the, the, the little fractures happen, we can cope with them because they happen within the context of an overall relationship of, of love and security and, and, and emotional connection. And, and then Gottman, uh, the the last aspect of the sound marital house that, that we'll look at now is is about accepting uh, our spouse's influence, and accepting influence is about showing honor and respect. We said that uh, you know honor is about uh, recognizing value, and when we accept somebody's influence, we are showing that their opinion is valuable to us. Uh, Peter says, 1 Peter 2 verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Uh, now, the research indicates that women tend to accept more influence from their husbands than, than vice versa. Um, it seems to be something that, that women do, do naturally. Uh, again, Romans 15 verse 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you, in order that you may bring praise to God. How did Christ accept us? Um, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He recognized uh, our, our weaknesses and our failings, and yet he still gave himself to us. And that, that's the kind of reciprocal relationship that couples should have. We recognize um, all of the, the things that are uh, negative, but at the same time, we we give of our of our best to our spouse. Um, this is a key uh, uh, statistic that when a husband is not willing to accept influence from his wife, there is an eighty one percent chance that the marriage will self destruct. Um, that just shows you how important it is for, for men to appreciate the role that they play uh, within their marriages. Um, going back to what I said before, because women tend to do it naturally, men need to be more intentional about making sure that they, they will accept influence from their wives. Um, accepting influence invokes uh, actively seeking common ground. So, uh, Adventist Home, page 118, Ellen White says, Men and women sometimes act like undisciplined children. The husband wants his way, the wife wants her way. Um, but what we need to learn is how to yield to, to one another. It's what Paul says, submit to one another. Um, and this, this way of acting within a relationship can indicate emotional immaturity on, on, on the part of, of both the husband and the wife. Uh, the only way to be powerful within a relationship is to be able to, to accept um, influence. Uh, apparently, the, the martial art of Aikido 
works on the principle of of yielding in order to be powerful. You know, it, it's it's not a very forceful martial art. It actually uses the power of the other person um, in, in order to 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 gain uh, gain advantage. So it, the, the idea is that when we are willing to to be flexible, when we are willing to hear what the other person says, take their view into account, uh, make concessions that's when we become powerful within our relationship especially when that is is a give and take that goes both ways so both the husband and wife should be willing to yield his or her way or opinion according to ellen white okay so let's round up romans 12 and verse 10 Paul says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. And in this way, we become intimate allies. Why? Because we recognize the value that there is in, in our spouse and we invest in the relationship to help our spouses become the best that they can, can become. And when you have two uh, people within a marriage who are both working to outdo one another in showing love, um, they won't go far wrong. I hope that this is the experience that you can have in, in your own marriages and it's the experiences that you can encourage others to, uh, to, to have as you support the marriages within your sphere of influence. God bless you.